Okay, Professor Hildebrandt here with a lecture for chapter eight. I am cutting this chapter down a good bit. We're only gonna focus on the first three learning objectives that are looking at sampling and sampling methods. Um, and we are not going to do learning objectives four and five on the central limit theorem. So the goal for a sample is that it's an unbiased representation of our population, okay? Um, the first part of the chapter spends some time talking about why we do sampling. So just really quickly, um, some of the main reasons are sometimes it just takes too much time to study an entire population if it's really large. Um, and it could be cost prohibitive, right? It could be very expensive to try to study the entire population. Or some of our populations are infinite. You know, think about like all the gallons of water in Lake Erie. It is absolutely impossible to study every single gallon of water in Lake Erie and test it for bacteria or something like that. It's just not possible. Um, also, some, sometimes testing of our populations is destructive. So think of a winery, right? They bottle up this wine, they let it age for a bit, and then they're going to sell it. Well, before they do that, they're going to test it and make sure that the wine has the flavors and the characteristics that they're looking for but they can't test all of the wine. They wouldn't have any left to sell. So those are just some of the main reasons. Um, so make sure you go back through the first part of that chapter and review learning objective 8.1 on sampling methods. So I'm gonna move us forward to learning objective two on sampling errors. So while we do hope that our sample is a good representation of our population, it is very unlikely that it's an exact representation. So it's unlikely that the mean of the sample will be exactly equal to the mean of the population. So due to that, we have what is called a sampling error. So the difference between our sample statistic and the corresponding population perimeter that it's supposed to be representing. Here's an example. We have this inn called Foxtrot, and we're looking at the number of rooms they rented each day in June. And if we take the entire 30 days of June, we find that the average number of rooms rented, or mu, is 3.13. However, if we take three random samples of five days each, we might come up with sample means of 3.8, 3.4, and 1.8. So the difference between the sample mean and the population mean is called the sampling error. And so you simply take your mu, your population mean, and you subtract x bar, your sample mean. Um, and so sometimes your sampling error will be positive if the sample mean is greater than the population mean, and other times it will be negative. We could also pull back out our combination formula. If you recall this um, from an early, our earlier chapters. So we could use the combination formula. We have, um, to say, okay, well, what's the total number of possible samples of size five with this population that has um, 30 values? And so we could put in our sample size of five, and there's 30 days that we're pulling from. And remember, this was the factorial, so we had 30 factorial divided by five times the difference between 30 and five. Oh, I missed a factorial here and here. So anyway, if we worked this out, you would see there are 142,506 different samples within this population um, that we could use. And so the really cool thing though, is if we then summed up the sampling errors for all of those, the result would be zero. So it really is, you know, if we looked at everything, because at that point, um, we would be looking at almost the entire population. So we do know that our sample mean is an unbiased estimator of the population mean. So there will be some sampling errors um, but it's still a, a fairly good representation. So the next part of the chapter, looking at what's called a sampling distribution of the sample mean. This is going to help us test um, how accurate 
our sample mean really is. So a sampling distribution of the sample mean is simply a probability distribution, just like we've looked at in prior chapters. And this time though, it's a distribution of all possible sample means given a specific sample size. So a sample size of five, like the last example, or a sample size of two, okay? Um, and what we're gonna find is for a given sample size, if we find the mean of all the possible sample means in that size, um, it will actually equal the population mean. We also know that there's less variation in our distributions of sample means than there are in the population's distribution. And the sampling distribution of the sample mean does tend to become bell-shaped. So if it takes on um, in that you know, normally distributed kind of look. Um, so that is helpful because now we'll be able to use our empirical rule, also from a prior chapter, right, where we'll find that 68% of our sample means will be plus or minus one standard deviation, 95% will be within two standard deviations, and then 99.7 or virtually all are within three standard deviations. So let's look at an example to work through this. So we have this company, Tardis Industries, and they have seven production employees. So that's their total population is seven. Going with a small example, so I can show you guys the steps to work through this. Um, and then we're given the hourly earnings below in this table. And so the first question that we're asked is to find the population mean. So how are we gonna do that? Well, we're going to sum up all of our X values. So you would, we would just add up all of these and all of these, and then divide by the total uh, number in the population, right? That's my N, and in this case, it's seven. Um, and so we would have 108 divided by seven, which is $15.43. So the average hourly earnings for their employees, for the entire population, is $15.43. The next question says, okay, well, let's put together the sampling distribution of the sample mean for sample sizes of two. And so the first thing we have to kind of ask ourselves is, well, how, how many samples are possible with a size of two? So again, we're gonna use that combination formula. We have seven people in our population. We're pulling a sample size of two. So it's seven factorial over two factorial times the difference of seven and two factorial. And if you work this out, right, is that seven times six times five, and it keeps going. And then down here, we'd have two times one. Seven minus two is five. So we'd have five times, and we would keep going. But all of that will cancel out with all of this, and we end up with an answer of 21. So there are 21 possible samples of size two within this population. So 21 possible samples. So let's list them all out. So here we go, we have one through 11, Joe and Sam, Joe and Sue, Joe and Bob, so on. And then we kind of need a line like right here, because now here we have 12 through 21. So these are all the different possible sample sizes of two, this column here and this column down here, all these red ones that I'm highlighting, okay? Um, so we have to find the mean of each of these 21 samples. Well, easy enough. You just take their hourly wages and you sum them. So 14 plus 14 is 28. 28 divided by two gives a, the first sample a mean income or hourly wage of 14. Then we do 14 plus 16 is 30 divided by two gives us 15. So on and so forth until we get all of these means. So this column here and this column here. Those are all of the sample means. So using this, we can now make that distribution table. So if you look through, you should see that all of the sample means are in the range of $14 up to 17, okay? And so to make our distribution table, we're simply going to tally up. So how many times do we see 14, well, let's count. One, two, three, that's it. So 14 occurs three times. We could do the same thing for 15, 16, and 17, okay? 
And then we would have this table here. So again, we have our four options for the sample means hourly wage, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And then we simply tallied up the count of each of those um, from our, and that gets us back to all 21 of our samples. Um, now we can also then write out our probabilities for each. So again, this is from an earlier chapter. Recall, we take the number of times it's occurring, the total possible times it could have occurred, so three of 21, for a probability of an hourly wage of $14 of 0.1429. This one is simply nine divided by 21. Here we'll have six divided by 21, and then once again, three divided by 21. And just like we've talked about before, all of the probabilities in our distribution should add up to one, and they do. So, next question says, okay, well then what is the mean of the sampling distribution? And so to find that, we're simply going to sum up all of the sample means and divide by our total number of samples, which again, our lowercase n here was 21. So if we sum up 14, times three plus 15 times nine plus 16 times six plus 17. Okay, this is what we will get. And what is then the mean of our sampling distribution? It is $15.43, which again does exactly match the mean of our population. So the last question said, okay, well what observations then can be made about our population and about the sampling distribution. Well, again, the mean of the distribution of the sample means, $15.43, was exactly equal to the mean of the population. Um, looking here, I've, we've graphed them. So this first graph is your probability distribution, and the second one is the distribution of the sample mean. And you will see there is less spread or variation in the sample, the distribution of the sample mean. Um, it's ranging from $14 to 17, whereas our population's distribution was 14 to 18, so it's a little more spread out. Um, and the shapes of these are different, right? Again, the distribution of the sample mean is kind of starting to take on that bell-shaped curve, um, whereas our population's distribution did not. Okay, so I'm gonna work a second example. I promised those who were in class they would get one too. Um, so I'm gonna work this second example. So we have a population of five values, zero, zero, one, three, and six. And we're looking here at a sample size of three. So the first thing we're gonna do is, okay, well how many combinations are possible with a population of five? So using the combination formula and then pulling a sample of three. So it'll be five factorial divided by three factorial times the difference of five and three factorial. So five times four times three times dot, dot, dot. Here we would have three times dot, dot, dot because those will cancel out. And then five minus three is just two factorial, which is just two times one. And so the answer to the first question on how many combinations are possible with a sample size of three is 10. Okay, so there's are 10 of them possible. Um, well, next it's like, okay, well, then let's list out all of the samples and compute the sample mean. And so you can do that on your own, okay? Um, and then we're asked to, just like we did in the last one, okay, well, let's find, oh, wait, I did do it. Sorry, y'all. So we have 10, right? And so here they are listed. We sum them up. So zero plus zero plus one is one. One divided by three is 0.33. And then we'll do the same thing for all of them so that we're getting, this should say down here, the sample mean. The sample mean in the last column. Then to find the mean of the distribution of sample means, I am going, so that's the mu x bar. I'm just going to sum up all of those sample means and divide by n. And so I sum up that last column, I would get 19.98. And I'm going to divide that by 10. 
And so I get 1.998, okay? And if I were to just calculate the mean of the population, so my mu, um, if I added up all those values, you would get to 10, and there are five total numbers, right, in our population, and so I get an average of 2.0. Now, it's not 100% exact, but it's fairly close. Um, we are dealing here with a really small population, and so that's why, but obviously, if we rounded up 1.998, we would get back to that population average of 2.0. Um, so again, we would say that basically the means of the sample uh, distribution and the mean of the population are basically the same. Um, again, there's less dispersion in our sample means because our range here is 0.33 to 3.33, whereas the population's values were ranging from 0 to 6, so there was more variation in the population. So hopefully now that I've worked through two examples, this helps. Again, this is the only content that we will be covering in Chapter 8. Let me know if you have any questions.